Welcome once again to Off Planet Radio. This is live. Sorry, the last hour was a pre-record for those of you who jumped on to the uh, streams or the boards tonight. A um, couple of little switch rounds and schedules going on. And besides that, I thought that uh, it was important that the uh, interview that I did with David Martin be heard as many places as possible because we're pushing another level here right now against the cabal in getting to a place where we liberate ourselves from their systems as much as possible. And uh, I'm not going to do an extended intro monologue tonight. I think I got myself in enough trouble last week doing that, and uh, the chips fell where they may. So anyway, I have on the line with me my guest for tonight, and I'm really, really excited. I've never really done a show on uh, megalithic structures because it's not an area of my expertise and that's probably going to be a good thing because I think our guest tonight is going to educate us he's coming to us on Skype from Ireland and uh, that is kind of the setting for what we're going to talk about tonight we're going to talk about the New Grange Sirius Mystery and when you put New Grange when you put Sirius and Mystery in a title you've got my attention I kind of mentioned this last week, one of my earliest touchstones in getting into the area that I did uh, with this show was a book called The Serious Mystery that Robert Temple put out in the late 70s. I think I read it mm, mid-80s, somewhere in around there. And it was my first real touchstone with what's called extraterrestrial contact in terms of really studying it out. Um there were only a couple of people working in the field at the time. Eric Von Doniken being the other most prominent. Temple came at it from a different direction. He connected what we believe to be a, a culture, an ancient culture that grew up with some advanced knowledge of astronomy and how our galaxy and our solar system uh, were formed with some amazing results. And having said all that... We're going to talk tonight about the New Grange Serious Mystery, and my guest is E.A. James Swagger. He's on the line with me. James, welcome to Off Planet Radio tonight. Hey, Randy. Thank you for having me on the show. It's good to have you on. It's good to hear your voice. Uh, we did a fair amount of texting, but tonight's the first we've really had a chance to uh, go voice to voice, so it's going to be fun. Yeah. For sure. Uh, thank you for mentioning the book, uh, Robert's book. Uh, I could have actually easily went into that in my book, but I didn't want to be regurgitating other people's materials, and I, I kind of. I kind of felt that was its own little entity anyway, but uh, yeah, it's it's important work that Robert did. Like and, uh, uh, he laid yeah, the groundwork. There were you know the shoulders of giants thing. We 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 stand on the shoulders of giants. Well, that's and, it. And uh, your work. It, tonight, we will not be talking about aliens, so let, relax about that. It, we all needed to chill a little bit. But it, this is, as I quip to you, uh, on, you know, talking, this is a more grounded show, literally, because your approach to this was to come at it from the, what I guess we would call, astro-archaeological standpoint. Yeah. Yeah, that's you got astroarchaeology or archaeoastronomy. Yeah, uh, I wasn't sure which one, I, which way I was going to hyphenate. I'm not sure either. I use yeah. both as well. Yeah, so I am a multiple uh, hyphenator, so I can take it and mangle it any <laughs> exactly. way you want to go. Yeah, I think the mainstream kind of accept archaeoastronomy now. They actually have an institute for archaeoastronomy now, uh, set up by the very people that didn't want it to be, <laughs> which is uh, which is kind of funny, yeah. But yeah, it's it's a, it's got a World uh, International Institute for Archaeoastronomy now, so they kind of run with that, but yeah, a lot of people use astroarchaeology. But, um, 
But yeah, fascinating subject. It totally is, it is. And I just, wow, I just had a brain fart. Um, anyway, I, clearly, and this is always the leading question, everybody asks it. I have to ask it too, we'll keep it brief. You are not originally an astroarchaeologist by trade, but you kind of had, I guess, the groundwork for this. So how did you wind up moving from, you worked in the energy industry, as I understand. You Mostly went, energy, yeah. Um, water industry, energy industry. Uh, coming at most of my career from an engineering standpoint, but uh, I did get into physics and astronomy. I wanted some sort of a career change. I, I wasn't quite sure, but, uh, you know, and I uh, did a Master's of Science and Research in Society, um, and I also have an MN, a Master's of Engineering. So very heavy in science and engineering, my, my, my career, but... Uh, I'd actually had tried to start writing a book um, from a, an earlier expedition. I was doing a historical histories magazine, and I was asked as a favour to write short articles on history of science, history of engineering, history of metallurgy. Uh, compile some articles for this historical histories magazine. So I had some little bit of writing experience in my early twenties, and uh, it was a bit of fun for me. And I was using my uh, engineering and science background to give insight into historical mysteries and uh, so yeah I, that was kind of my approach and I, I thought I would I, I would go back to that I wanted something to do um, I'm very passionate about history I always have been since I was a kid since I first read about Machu Picchu in the Andes I, I was mm -hmm. about 10 yeah. I was 10 I was reading it in an encyclopedia and I remember the light switched on for me because I was shocked that a civilization could vanish and this little city was in the Andes waiting to be discovered I just didn't get that as a kid I was like how did he forget about it why is it gone <laughs> so, yeah, very, yeah. you know. So, and then I discovered there was another civilization that fell, and it was always about the ancient stuff. Why these civilizations were so grand and big, like Egypt and uh, the Romans, have been the latest one. I, I don't really kind of like recent history, but uh, so all these civilizations seem to have just come and gone and lost everything they had. And you know, nearly every civilization we've ever had on this planet has been wiped out, and we're probably going <laughs> the much. right way. Yeah, we're probably going the same way this way, but. Uh, mm -hmm. So the passion for history has always been there, and uh, I thought I would, I would write a historical histories book. Um, sorry, sorry, a historical mysteries book. And I, I got halfway through that book, Randy, and I thought naively I was going to write a chapter on megalithic monuments. And, you know, I didn't have as deep an interest as the other ancient Egypt, uh, Romans, Greeks, um, as much as I thought, like. And... Uh, you know, but I had, I'd always seen a lot of megalithic stuff. Um, I Basically, my mum's Danish. There's a lot of passage graves over in Denmark. I had always travelled on the ferry from Ireland to Brittany. Brittany's another megalithic hotspot. So was Ireland. I'd lived in the UK for 10 years from North Scotland down to the very bottom in Cornwall. Mm -hmm. Again, all megalithic hotspots. I was just naturally in that terrain by default. I was working there, travelling there. You know, I, I would go and just goof off a stone circle or a, a passage grave or something ancient like it's it's that's the thing about the UK like I mean we've got stuff thousands of years old well, of course you know, you, and you have Stonehenge uh, and you yeah. talk about that uh, and I need to ask you this I would have probably sure. saved it later but in those structures were you sensing are you sensitive to energies that maybe are there echoes of the past that that kind of feeling of something per really old Personally, I'm not. I'm more of a psychoanalytical person. I think of what the people were doing in their. I get into their mind more than anything. Uh -huh. I do. I do actually touch the stones. <laughs> I put my hand through it, but I don't feel anything. I get a buzz off it, yeah. But I know there's people there, and they and they do go out dowsing, and I know there's. I'm not knocked off for anything, yeah. I mean, there's there's people out there, and they uh, they really get into that, yeah. And there's people say they feel the energy. It's electric, like, but that can change with the time of the morning, and it depends what time you're there too, Randy, because the magnetic field of the earth is at its peak at about quarter to four in the morning so mm -hmm. you, know, you won't feel energies later on in the day uh, are sensitive like, and the magnetic anomalies around the places that they built these ancient sites too so oh, it's a whole that's other real it's interesting a, yeah, yeah, there's a subject called geomancy, and then it's uh, something I was, like uh, you're, you're, You must have got a hold of my question list. I was going to ask you about that. <laughs> yeah, we'll go oh, into well, that a little later, maybe. Yeah, we'll get into that a little later, but. Uh, 
as I was saying, I thought I would naively write a chapter on megalithic monuments, and I was just going to breeze through this chapter, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, there's nothing really interesting to see here, you know, and, you know, I ended up, I happened to be back in Ireland, and I had a friend with me, and I was like, you know, I'd seen Newgrange, Noth, and I said, there's another one around the corner, it's called Doth, uh, they've got funny names for these passage graves, and I said, it's off the beaten track, he'd been to the other two before, and I said, look, I'll take you this one, it's not too far, it's off the beaten track, nobody ever goes there, they've closed the door to it, you know, it's not on the visitor's site anymore, and, uh, but you can just walk into the field and see it, so... Off I went and I seen this star constellation on the rock again, but you know, I had been away since I developed complex engineering skills that I didn't have in my earlier youth and uh, analytical. You know, I'd done the physics with astronomy degree and you know, I was very aware of these complex cycles of precession. And I started looking at it again and I just got more interested in it. And uh, back up in Northern Ireland then I, I'd gone to another piece of rock art uh, and I'd been looking these up on sites and where to go I mean we're riddled with the stuff here like I mean there's something like a hundred passage graves in the whole of Ireland but there's a lot of rock art too so the rock art's what you want to be looking at because you can kind of decipher some of that and put it with the other stuff and trying to come up with something so <laughs> but I, I discovered some rock art that was wrongly deciphered um, if you want to call it that I personally see that anyway and I didn't see anything to be deciphered I just seen to constellations or some major or some minor and I went this is wrong somebody's done this wrong and it's so off the beaten track there isn't going to be that many people there and I mean even if the people that do find this place they're not necessarily going to be an astronomer or engineer and they might not recognize it for what it is so statistically you know I can see why this has happened um, so I looked for other stuff in the area I found another passage drive from a lady at a house nearby and she told me and before I knew it I was getting suckered into this whole investigative procedure <laughs> and I went right well I just wanted to correct what was there on the rock art and it spurred me off to the other place and then I got I went hang on there's, there's a lot more to read about here I've overlooked some stuff like yeah I was a bit <laughs> I was a bit uh I was, well, I was, it was attractive to me because of my engineering and astronomy. So, by the time I knew it, I had a book in my hands, and I and I was so suckered in. You know, you, you got to understand, I had been reading a lot of archaeoastronomy while I was away too, and uh, I was sitting on oil rigs working twelve to sixteen hours a day. Yeah, and the only reason I worked a sixteen hour day is I couldn't be bother going back to a tiny little cell or so it was like mm -hmm. prison yeah yeah that's uh, always you fun, know and it? I, okay oh yeah i used to read a lot there you know but i was driving myself insane so i just i'd work long hours have a lot of money and i would, then i'd take a couple of weeks off and i would go and travel and you know i was i was in regions where i had megalithic stuff you know but uh so yeah i hadn't i, I hadn't read into the, this megalithic stuff as much as i did and i just got suckered into that again and then i said right that's it i'm having a little career break here i, I really needed it personally anyway and uh, i just jumped straight into the megalithic stuff and i wanted to do it because i seen something about procession i seen some stuff that was worthy of further research and i didn't see anybody compiling it in ireland like they were and i mean procession and archaeoastronomy has really taken off, especially with the ancient Egypt, Robert Boval and the pyramids. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, and Graham Hancock, you know, these guys are idols to me. Like, I grew up in my early 20s, you know, and these guys were just out there doing it, and you're talking laptops that would barely compute what a calculator <laughs> well, was Boval, doing back then. Well, yeah, those two guys you know, have sort of... Uh, they Go pioneered on. it for us. They pioneered it, and they also helped deconstruct the stronghold that the Egyptologists exactly. have on the archaeological sites. And I know they, you've they, talked about this. You know, actually, it's funny you pick up on that because Zahi was uh, arrogant, to say the least, but, you know, he thought that he could just rule the roost. But uh, it came to a point when... Robert Boval and Hancock and you know they, they have a lot of sway with the public uh, mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and, their, and their readers and you know Graham Hancock sold 5 million books so they realised tourism was being affected when they thought that you know Egypt was being closed to opinions so they had to let the people in and let them have a bit of a free thought although they still monitor who comes and looks at these monuments and digs stuff out of the ground you know they still have that stronghold. It's still there, but they're a bit more open to letting people in now and discussing ideas freely. They can't ram stuff down people's throats anymore. And that's what they were doing for a long time. So those two guys, they really did like uh, deconstruct the, the mainframe Egypt, Egyptological mindset that was being instilled in us. Like. So 
again, that that whole Archeo Stormy thing, it, the flavour was there in Europe, and uh, you know, people were going round, particularly Stonehenge, but also Callanish in, in northwest Scotland, which I go to a little in the book as well. But uh, you know, there was nobody doing really procession all over Ireland and, and putting get, it together. Um, let's get some working definitions because you've mentioned procession a couple of times, so we need to define that. Sure. And also, let's better define what we mean by megalithic, especially when we're talking about megalithic cultures. Sure. Okay. Uh, I'll tell you the megalithic one first. Basically, when I talk megalithic, we're talking standing stones, stone circles, and maybe passage graves, yeah? I mean, the Egypt, py- Egyptian pyramids, the Great Pyramids, it could be classed as megalithic as well. So could Easter Island, but mm-hmm. we're just talking about Western Europe megaliths. Right, right. I think, yeah. the, I think the pyramids are separate from that, even by yeah, definition, in, because in term- of... Yeah. Yeah, I do too, but a lot of people would say they're a megalithic construction, but they're not the megalithic civilization. Now, so we're talking about the megalithic civilization of Western Europe, basically. The next, the next definition, if you can, is passage graves. What are they? Sure. Passage grave uh, is a bit of a misnomer because uh, a passage grave basically has a funerary function to it. They found ashes of cremated uh, remains inside these passage graves. So... They're given this grave function, this funerary rite, um, which is which is true. This, and we're not taking that away from them, but they also have these astronomical function, and you, it's like saying it's got two functions, but we're only going to call it this one, and mm-hmm. that's what the mm-hmm. archaeologists do. But basically, a passage grave is, is an earth mound, mostly circular, sometimes topped with small stones and rocks, and it's got a large curbstone around it. Okay, um, and then there's an entranceway, uh, usually facing to southeast. East or southwest, northeast, northwest, some sort of a cardinal position that would take in the sun or the solar or lunar function. So it's 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 open. The entrance usually opens up to one of these uh, special uh, angles uh, for solar or lunar functions. And the passageway would usually wind its way in, uh, quite narrow and quite low, uh, to an inner chamber, and that's where you would find the cre- cremated remains. Now, let's just describe the inner chamber for a second. It would predominantly have a corbel vault ceiling uh, overlapping stones to make a bit of height in it so you, it's quite a big room inside um, some of them can be up to five meters tall inside um, and they'll have little recesses to the left to the right and to the back um, and they'll, sometimes they'll, they'll find ceremonial bowls that would maybe weigh I don't know seven several hundred kilos anyway um, you wouldn't you would take two or three to lift them like and uh, mm-hmm. that's where in the ceremonial bowls is where you would find the ashes of the dead so it's supposedly thought that on these special days of the year like the winter solstice or the summer solstice uh, just taking those two maybe the spring and autumn equinox that they would cremate the bones outside and bring them inside and uh, lay their ashes on those special days into the ceremonial bowls that's supposedly, that's the only supposition. Um, mm-hmm. So, again, it's, it's very hard to talk about passage graves because people go, what's a passage grave? And, and they just hear the word grave and passage and they dream up all sorts of stuff. But yes, they're basically an astronomical observatory, first and foremost, Randy. That, that's exactly what they are. They're, they're aligned not just to a solar or lunar phenomenon, but they have rock art on some of these curbs that are indicative of complex calculations, um, basically observational astronomy. Um, and the peak of observational astronomy will lead you to precession, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But, uh, you know, I mean, observational astronomy is basically looking at the stars and observing everything with your naked eye, no telescopes, basically, yeah, trying to figure out the cosmology of the universe just by looking upwards. <laughs> you might mm-hmm, think that's... Mm-hmm. That's quite a daunting task, but you know when you start with the solstices, Randy, yeah, you find out what's the shortest day of the year, what's the longest day of the year, yeah, you find out this, that the spring and autumn day uh, equinox day is of equal night, day and day and night is of equal length, sorry. So you got these four points of the year, you start with that, and that's good. Um, you get on to lunar then, and then you know you start observing. The lunar always goes around the the band of the equator, and. Uh, you know, then you have these cycles of 19 years that the, if basically if you look up at the sky and you see the, the moon 19 years later, you will see it in the same position again. So 
it's a little bit harder to discover that cycle, but uh, give it a little for observations. And if you watch everything and make recording your measurements and, you know, just set up a system for observing the sky, observational astronomy, you can figure out quite a lot, Randy. I mean, it's, it's, it sounds like quite daunting. I mean, the masters of it were the Mayans. They literally new complex uh, cycles of Venus as well as the Earth. Yeah, absolutely. And they probably, as well as that, the Mayans, just on their observational astronomy, they probably knew that the Earth and Venus went around the Sun in a ratio of 5 to 8. And their L, I said that at the start of the book, that their L Caracol Observatory is a, is a monument to that. It's, it's a testament that they had this oblong base that and it, it's the only thing that explains it. Um, and I mean, if they knew that the Earth and the and Venus were going around in a ratio of 5 to 8, well then they probably knew it was going around the Sun as well. Again, it's very hard to prove all that, but they're, they're, the, the architecture that they leave us behind, Randy, is really what what we have to study, you know, and it takes engineers and astronomers to look at this stuff, to put it together and go, oh, right, they, they, these guys were pretty advanced, they were doing quite a lot, like. So, we're about three weeks away right now from December 21st, Yeah, I've got a big day planned for yeah. that, yeah. And so, so actually, what, what, I'm, I'm guessing um, that these particular sites and Newgrange in specifically, are places where people may go to observe that particular day? Pro- problem with Newgrange, I mean, everybody goes on the summer solstice to uh-huh, Stonehenge, uh-huh. and everybody can, there's hundreds and thousands of people go there. I mean, you can't even get down the roads because it's an open field, and everybody can go and witness this. The problem with Newgrange is a tiny little room inside a mound, and only 50 to 100 people can fit, depending on um, adults, children, or size of people. So it's quite a condensed little room inside. Um, so not a lot of people can observe this, and it's done by lottery every year. So I do, yeah, people do gather outside. So it's, it's, it's a spectacular phenomenon to witness this sunbeam coming through this uh, on this special day of the year. But it takes away, Randy, really from a lot more that was going on. I mean, that was just one specific function of this monument. It may have been the most spectacular in terms of of, uh, a a yearly event. I mean, some people say it's quite a sexual function where the sunbeam would penetrate, and Newgrange is actually in the shape of a womb. It's Mm -hmm. a Mm -hmm. a kidney-shaped monument. It's not totally circular. It's a kidney-shaped monument, and uh, they say that this was kind of a rich... the, the, The other one, Note, has got a what they call a male and a female stone. So they have this kind of kind of male and fe- ma- masculine and feminine function to them as well. So there's kind of a lot of things going on at these monuments. It's not just this spectacular solar event, but of course, to modern spectators, I mean, this is wonderful that 5,000 years ago, these people were building this just for that alone, just for this sunbeam penetrating. Now, let's not underestimate that, that one specific function, Randy, to get that to go into a monument 19 meters takes a lot of marking out. I mean, you'd be, you'd probably marking out the site for about 25 to 50 years. Wow. This is Swiss watchmaking, basically. Yeah. yeah. Swiss watchmaking with giant stones, basically. Wow. <laughs> now, not only that, you've got to say that the archaeology uh, mindset at, uh, still today says that they were only living to 25 to 30 years old. So, then that tells you there's three gener- two to three generations of people having to... You're not even going to see this thing finished. You know, it's your, third gener- your third generation is going to see this thing finished. It might have taken two years, two you know, years to build. That long view of realizing something was actually part of the uh, building projects of the Renaissance as well. They built cathedrals see, that s- projects spanned over lifetimes, generations. Sure. So, I mean... There had to be a very solid culture to be doing that. You mean for you not to see your finished product? I mean, you know that that that's there was a very serious motivation behind that. That's that's the way I so see it. So, what do you believe the the primary uh, purpose of these structures were? If that was well, one small aspect of it. Sure. Well, I, I started the book with Newgrange and I finished the book with Newgrange and. Uh, but I have gone into the other monuments. The problem is you can't just concentrate on one of these, and that's why I actually went around Ireland, uh, Randy, to figure this question out. Well, that's a very good question you just asked me, yeah? And it took me a lot of traveling around <laughs> Ireland. I think I've done 75 of the 100-plus passage graves, and uh, the only reason I didn't do the other 30 is because they're pretty much 
totally ruinous. There's just a pile of stones. Now, left. let me ask you this, and this will go a little bit into geomancy. Um, yeah. In <clears throat> it seems like these are concentrated, and they're concentrated more in uh, the particular Sustance. area of Europe. Are they arrayed on any grid uh, geomanically that you can discern? I actually, I just wanted to write a book about archaeoastronomy, and I did discover some stuff, Randy, that I didn't put in the book. I do actually probably going to go down, maybe do a wider a wider uh, Western European passage grave book, maybe, yeah? Maybe take in a few more and do Brittany, Dan- Denmark, and Ireland all together. But, you know, the reason I didn't was because there's, there's a lot of rock art in Ireland. I mean, uh, some of the rest of them are really lacking in art. Uh-huh. So it's very hard to say. You mean, you're, all you're going to do is get a compass alignment, and then, you know, it, it, it lacks kind of substance, if, if, you, if you will. So, but I did discover that there, you know, you can... There's clusters of these passage graves in Ireland. Let me just explain the terrain. Newgrange has a passage grave there on that side. Before you go that, uh, for the listeners, there's links on the uh, show page at offplanetradio.net, and I put a link into the Wolf Spirit Radio chat room as well, where they can go to your blog and see the site, site by site, with the pictures and everything. Sure, yeah. Newgrangecosmology.com and jameswagger.com. Everything's linked up there. And... uh, so yeah, these these passage graves are actually built in clusters. Let's just say that first and foremost. They're they're called megalithic cemeteries, Randy, yeah. I mean Newgrange is probably the most famous one in the world, but equally in Brittany you've got Gavrinus, which basically is French for Goat's Island and it's, on, it's this one sits on an island. But uh Wales in the UK you've got two beside each other as well. But if you draw a line from megalithic cemetery to megalithic cemetery to megalithic cemetery, it actually goes straight. There's a line that picks up three of these in a straight line. And then if you keep continuing the line, it will actually hit the ones in Wales as well. And it will keep going and hit Stonehenge as well. So there's a geomancy line there. There's a special line that goes from Cornwall through Stonehenge up through London. Um, again, that's these called uh, ley lines, yeah? Because that kind of puts a third dimension into it when you're it dealing with the, with, with the stones on the ground and what is above them and what is being brought into them ast- astronomically and then the fact that perhaps they're arrayed on grid lines. Now you've got something very interesting. I mean, yeah, very interesting. I mean, it's something I, I actually steered away from, from the book because I didn't want to... Oh, I understand. It, it sounds like... You know, I really did want to mention it. I did really want to mention it. And, you know, I actually did probably want to do another chapter on the Dogon as well, but I didn't want to start confusing people. I just wanted a good, solid archaeoastronomy data book. I wanted it to be something like a reference that people could look up. And and that's what it is, too. My my 30-second book review is this is really a great way for somebody to get acquainted with the subject of megalithic sites in general, and specifically... The sites in Ireland and uh, Europe that you've talked, you write about in this book. I mean, Newgrange is considered the most complex megalithic site in the world for, um, for, for a very good reason. I mean, <laughs> Newgrange has a couple of baby ones beside it, and then you have Noth, uh, which is only about two kilometres away. Uh, it's got the longest passage grave in Europe, and it's got 18 baby mounds beside it, and the baby mounds are 20 metres in diameter. So, I mean, you see, here in the north, here here in North America, we have something somewhat similar uh, in the, Mount, well, the mountain builders. You know, Ohio and West Virginia both have them, and it's real concentrated. To to but you I'd know, love to go to Serpent Mound. I've always wanted to go to Serpent yeah, Mound. It's amazing. They're, these are yeah. amazing places to see. And but, they, but they chose these places very specifically. Yeah, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't just uh, not, and you know, it wasn't just uh, that. That's that's the thing that kind of led me down that ley line route you know because when you look at Newgrange it's actually in a nice area it's very low lying land uh, it's on the banks of the river Boyne um, which some people say is a celestial representation of the Milky Way um, it's actually the nat- largest natural amphitheater in the world so and it's very fertile arable land and there's your fourth dimension because then you've got the whole thing going on with the acoustics that are going on there Sure, I actually am writing a book in the new year and I have done some acoustics research and that's again, I didn't want to, I, I mentioned that a little bit in the book I'm aware of the, the uh, paranormal art, there's art there's mm-hmm. art 
that is uh, indicative of astronomy, but there's art that's also indicative of altered states of consciousness. Oh yeah. And and there's and there's a whole list of images that are called entoptic phenomena, and it's basically the things, the images that you see, basically zigzag lines, squiggles. Um, there's a whole list of about forty images that you could well, those, possibly those those spirals. Inside, Spirals, yeah. Yeah, Newgrange, um, wow, you could take that. That's that's a whole sidecar in itself. Sure. Um, yeah, I have my own theory on the on the triple spiral as well. Uh, it's to, I'll get into procession a little later. Uh, okay. But, uh, but I, I yeah. do have my own theory on that, and I'm the only one that actually has a direct correlation between the spir- tri-spiral on the outside of, of Newgrange and the tri-spiral on the inside. Yeah, it's actually quite fitting and very neat. And uh, I think there's 26 interpretations for the for the tri-spiral, but mine's the only one that explains both. So <laughs> I'm quite happy with that, Mike. And, uh, <laughs> they want to get a little mention of that, but okay. so yeah. Look, let let's just say where these are at. I mean, you've got the Newgrange Cemetery complex. Yeah, it's called the Boyne Valley, where, where it's situated. And there's probably about forty in the Boyne Valley of these passage graves. Not all big. Now there, there's some baby ones as well, but uh, there's forty there. There's another place called Loch Crew. Um, there may have been up to a hundred there at one point, but there's only about forty left now. And out of the forty that's left, there's two main ones, and a lot of them are like missing their tops. But you know, you can still see some art. You can see their alignments. You can see the inner chambers. Um, you know, and then you go to a place called Carroll Keel, which is in the west of Ireland. It's got another cemetery complex. These are the three biggest ones, by the way. Mm-hmm. And Carroll Keel is situated on a thousand feet high uh, mountain range. So, I mean, these these are totally different terrains. I mean, the one in Loch Crew, uh, you can see it's it's quite hilly, and uh, you can see a third of Ireland from the Loch Crew Cemetery complex. And I mean that by county, not not actually by eye. I mean, uh, there's something like a, a third of the counties in Ireland you can see from that spot. So wow. again, you can't do that in Newgrange. I mean, Newgrange is down in a little valley down by the river, so it's totally different terrain each place you go to. And each style is slightly different as well. So you've you got to quite beg the question, I mean, why pick these places? But they're all in a straight line. Is there an astronomical reason for that? Quite possibly. Uh, is there a ley line reason for that? Quite possibly. Like, um, But, you know, uh, I, I concentrated on them clusters uh, of megalithic cemeteries. Um, and in doing so, I developed that whole passage grave cosmology that I talk about in the book, a, a good reason of what they were up to, what they were doing. I tried to compile it from uh, a complex procedure. Basically, any engineer out there, Andy, is going to take, uh, he's going to look at the engineering aspect of something, but their engineers are decision makers, and they, and they need data to make their decision. So I'm doing it from an engineering perspective. I'm gathering all the data from all the different sites. I'm looking for something that's similar. I'm looking for something I can put together and assimilate. And, uh, you know, y- y- you come to the point when you look at what they were doing, when you, when you hammer out the solstices, and you hammer out all the alignments, and then you realize then that some of these things are aligned, Randy. And this is, this is the clincher. They, these guys left us an easy clue because they're, some of them are facing north, very close to north. I mean, a few de- degrees off true north. Mm-hmm. And that means, in astronomical terms, the sun and the, and the moon is ruled out. So then you go, right, well, if they're not looking at the sun and the moon, there's not much left to look at. Um, so you have to look at constellations. And that's when things really open up because... Um, in Carl Keel, there's evidence they fixated five passage graves on the five belts, on the five stars of the Cassiopeia constellation. And, and when I figured that out, I realized, well, why the hell would they do that? Why on earth would they fixate that on five? But, you know, you start asking questions then. Um, you know, and, and one thing is that they wanted to see was that constellation moving across the sky at the same time. Let's, let's just realize that if you're going to look at stars... You need to look at them on the same day, of the same date, of the same day every year. Right, I mean, right. there's no because the constellations change, especially in this part of the hemisphere. Um, the precession of all the equinox well, depends on the area star sign from Aries, Taurus. They, they, these constellations process around the band of the equator, and I mean the constellations that you see in January are going to be different to the ones you see in the summertime. So, but again. You look, say, the 6th of January, yeah? You're going to see the same constellations on the 6th of January the following 6th of January, yeah? If right, you go out right. at the same time of night. So, 
that's the, that's why I believe that they were hammering out these these uh, stellar or these uh, solar functions. They were waiting for the shortest day of the year because that's the day they were going to observe the same stars. You know, now you wouldn't wait a whole year, so you're going to do one on the equinox, spring, and the, and the, one on the summer solstice, and one on the autumn equinox. So you get four days of the year when all the conditions are right to then look at the same constellations in the sky and figure out is there anything else going on so they kept developing their uh, skill set they kept building on what they had known so I mean it, it gets quite it gets quite daunting when you're trying to put this all together um, you know with there's, there's guys have gone before me too, Randy, and you know I'm drawing on the work of others too. You know I'm not just a little genius out there putting this all together really quickly. You know there's there's a lot of rock art that I I relied on. I don't agree with all the rock art, but you know there's some of it there that's really kind of it's a it's a no brainer. Like I mean it's got 19 uh, counting both ends of a line. It's got a lunar squiggle with 19 turns on it um, and the number 19 is synonymous with lunar so there's, there's reasons why we're able to figure out some of the rock art yeah? so they're following lunar cycles and they're citing particular constellations yeah. and that brings us into the procession aspect of That's it which has to do with a variation <laughs> in what in terms of the constellations okay, you can explain so that better than I can yeah I'll give you the layman's version. Yeah, yeah the stars. Good. Right, you got this. The, you got the daily motion of the Earth, night and day, twenty-four hours spinning on its axis. Yeah, mm-hmm. and then you have the Earth going around the sun. That's another motion. That's a yearly thing, three hundred and sixty-five point two five days. The, and then you have this other, uh, lesser known. Uh, it's a wobble in the Earth. It's another cycle, and it's basically. A cycle that takes 26,000 years. And it's just like a spinning top. If you picture the Earth spinning around on its axis, it doesn't spin on a perfect axis. It's got a little wobble in it, like a spinning top about to slow down. Mm-hmm. But it's, this wobble is very, very slight. It's, it's, a, it's one wobble from left to right takes 26,000 years. Now, the effect that has is basically we're on the Earth. Uh, the stars aren't wobbling, but the, the Earth's wobbling. So, but we're on the Earth. So we look up, we see the stars wobbling, but it's actually the Earth doing a wobble. Now that's the layman terms is basically if you were to look up at any constellation, they're going to shift, they're going to move over time. I mean, long t- long periods of time. It's 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 roughly equates to one degree every seventy two years. So you want to go out on the twenty first of December this year, and you want to go and look at a star constellation seventy two years from now, it's going to shift one degree, and it's going to keep doing that until it goes 180 degrees to the left and 180 degrees to the right. And what you have is this very um, hidden, it's like a hidden uh, motion that it's, it's, you're not going to see it unless you're talking long epochs, like a couple of hundred years. But let's not forget, you know, I mean, the works of Robert Paval that we mentioned earlier, I mean, and Graham Hancock, they've really gone into procession and what the ancient Egyptians knew about procession. Procession was very well known amongst ancient cultures. Um, and it seems, from my research, that it's no different in the megalithic civilization of Western Europe. Um, it's not what I was looking for, but I'm very surprised to find it because um, unless unless you're going to go and find some rock art to help you back up your theory, um, and I, and that's all we have in Ireland. We have a lot of rock art. I mean, a lot of the passage graves don't have rock art, apart from Gavrinus. So procession, basically, the stars are going to shift. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Give it 200 years, your monument's going to be out of. It's going to be out of alignment. It's not going to be out of any use. I mean, there's evidence that the uh, Temple of Dandera in Egypt, once procession had misaligned some of the constellations that it was aligned to, they would rip the temple down and start again and rebuild it every 200 years, and they and they can find the old foundations like. And that's something that Robert Temple goes into in his book because they aligned their temples to Sirius. Yeah. So. You know, it's it's fascinating that you could even know about procession, but I mean, the ancient Greeks called uh, this processional cycle the Great Year, and the Great Year was 26,000 years. I mean, some people actually reckon it's probably close to 24,000 years. Um, I mean, something we're finding hard to calculate these days with our modern modern tools, like, um, because procession is something, if you want to get into the detail, it, it, it speeds up and slows down. It's not a, it's not a straight, continuous uh, wobble. It's If you think about a spinning top, it wobbles to the left and wobbles to the right kind of in a in an erratic motion so sure, yeah yeah so again you know this this earth wobble thing i mean some people actually think it's a, a dark star 
the, I mean, what actually causes this procession is the biggest question of all. Like, I mean, it, it was always thought that the moon was tugging on the earth and giving it this little wobble, uh, just like the, it was pulling on the toys. But that could be another wobble called the Chandra wobble. But, um, it's probably thought that the whole solar system is wobbling now, and we have like a failed second sun somewhere out there, like a, a dark star, and it's actually pulling on our sun, the whole solar system. And well, I've the entertained that theory as well. I think a lot of people have. Yeah. You know, I, it's something I'm open to, and I tell you why, because there's satellites up there that are shot outside uh, enough of the Earth's orbit, uh, high enough that it's actually showing... Uh, problems with the processional. I mean, they've tweaked this processional, uh, this moon processional theory. They've tweaked it a hundred times. It's the hundred. They've reevaluated the equations one hundred times, Randy, and they're still not <laughs> right. And there's evidence to show that procession is actually affecting the whole solar system. Now, the problem with that is that's not a moon thing anymore. The only thing that could do that is something the size of the sun, or maybe maybe it's a red dwarf and. You've got to understand a binary system is, it could be just another red dwarf somewhere out there that we can't see and we may never see. Um, you know, so this uh, fail second sun theory, it, it, it's, it's, it's strong. Like, I mean, there's, there's good evidence to suggest it. And, you know, that's getting off topic. But, uh, you know, so that processional thing, it's there. And, and, I mean, the angels were very, very well aware of it. Let's, let's not forget now, anything pre-1500 B.C., uh, ancient sites were, had some sort of an astro- astronomical alignment to it. Ninety-five percent of them did, Randy. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's it's something I wasn't looking for. But when I found it in the megalithic civilization, particularly in Ireland, yeah. So, I mean, what is the dating for the, the the sites that you wrote about in this book? Because this was surprising. Sure. Um, Okay, Newgrange particularly is accepted as 3200 BC, but they often bandy about just 3000 BC. They're not too sure. Um, carbon dating would be in that 200 year window. Um, uh, and it's an important window, that, and I'll get into that a bit serious in, in a little bit. But um, So, yeah, I mean, when you go to some of the other megalithic cemeteries, uh, Loch Crew is considered a lot older, um, 3500 BC. Um, and Carol Keel, I have found that a 3500 BC alignment from an archaeoastronomy point of view, I mean, I've got five passage graves locked onto this constellation, basically, and there's nothing else it can face to because they're all facing nearly, nearly north, seven or eight degrees off north. And all these, uh, all these five passage graves are within one or two degrees of accuracy, which, I mean, even five degrees would be good enough, but. I mean, they're centrally fixated on each one of the each stars as the star sets on the horizon, and that only happens. These five stars do this at 3,500 BC, which is pretty much along where this is accepted as being built. And for that reason, uh, Carol Keel is accepted as a forerunner to Newgrange. Um, and uh, there is similarities between one of the passage graves there. It's got a light box in it, similar to Newgrange as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, 3,500 BC was probably where I would put this megalithic craze that happened in the West, in the British Isles. Let's call it a megalithic craze, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but I mean, there's evidence that note right beside Newgrange, it's going back to 4,000 BC uh, from farming uh, and some carbon dating there, but that's only habitation. It doesn't say anything about actually the building of the monument. Um, so yeah, it's a bit of a grey area. You could probably just put it between 4,000 and 3,000 BC safely, and, and most of the ancient ones, 3,500 BC. So we're going back a long time for, a, for an advancement in astronomy, uh, Randy. It's, it's, it's pretty advanced, like, what they were doing. You know, and, and a lot of people won't accept that. I mean, archaeology, they won't even have astronomers looking at this stuff. I mean, it's, it's alternative researchers out there going and finding this stuff. And that's a problem I find. Really. I find that a lot of people are having pot shots at this discovery process. Yeah, They're going, oh, I'm going to do a bit of the rock art, and they'll concentrate on that. And that's good, because sometimes you need somebody to specialize in something. But there's no central database of anybody putting this all together and going, and that's what I try to well, do. This is the this is the curse of specialization, and it begins with academia, which sure, exactly. has very tight disciplines, and it closes itself off from interdisciplinary study, which I think is where you're headed. It sounds like yeah. you're headed into an d- interdisciplinary study, no matter <laughs> how you approach this. Yeah, um, I, I kind of always did that in terms of 
what I wanted to feed my brain, let's call it that. I mean, mm-hmm. as I say, engineering, science, and a, a personal passion and history. So I just found something that I could put these three things together and do it. And along with the history of science and the history of engineering is great to me. I don't have to go into these big, monstrous, mega structures to go near money. I can sit there and I can do some fun. I can write a book in it and yeah, and have fun doing it and and, and apply my skill set and and, uh, and be useful like and enjoy doing it. You know, and that's probably what we need. We need some sort of an interdisciplinary the skill set of, uh, of I mean there's a lot of engineers coming forward too um, to study megaliths and uh, ancient monuments right right it appeals to that structured side of them and at the same time they're problem solvers and they see problems problem solvers. yeah exactly that's what we need problem solvers I mean I was a uh, I went on this holiday to the Algarve in Portugal and they've got some more passage graves down there and I particularly targeted that passage grave because I knew that I, from my reading and research that um, the art that was found there was very very similar to the art at a passage grave in Scotland and, I, and that doesn't make sense because there are two ends of uh, South Euro- southwestern Europe and northeastern Europe and some of the art is lacking in between so it doesn't make sense why they have art at both ends so I wanted to go see for myself and it was there I was like looking at this place and I walked in uh, it's probably something I haven't talked about since I was actually there with Randy but uh, the guy had no interest I mean I just assumed all these passage graves that I'm going to go and see outside my own home country of Ireland that you know they're all going to be as enthusiastic and as well laid out and there was a guy there, and you know he was disgusted that we walked in the door because he had to go and get up off his seat. <laughs> and you know, I said, yeah, "Have you got any books in English?" And he goes, "Yeah, there's one or two over there." And he couldn't; he just pointed at the shelf. And I went, "Okay, right. I'm <laughs> clearly annoying this guy. I'd better remove myself from this office." Like, <laughs> and it was an air-conditioned office, and he didn't even want to go outside. But uh, you know, there was no enthusiasm there. And as you say, that's the thing about. You know, there's nobody talking and putting these passage graves together in terms of a European phenomena. Mm-hmm. They're usually, each country is its own custodian of the monuments. I mean, Denmark, don't get me wrong now, is a very, very good uh, approach to it. I mean, they, they have made them all structurally sound for who you're going to visit. Again, they're lacking in rock art over there, but uh, they maintain their monuments very well over there. A lot of them are robbed from excavations in the 1900s, but of there's few archaeological uh, artifacts that they found. But uh, Now, the sites of the, in Ireland specifically, you wrote about some yeah. which were reconstructed. They've been excavated and uh, reconstructed. Is, am I to understand that correctly? Yeah. I mean, uh, Newgrange, it's got a white quartz wall on it, but, I mean, it gets a lot of criticism over that because they reckon that that actually might have just topped the pyramid like a uh, like the, the Newgrange, like a, like a white uh, cone-shaped uh, monuments uh, with white quartz, and it wasn't a wall at all. So I don't know why they ran with that. It was the 1960s. They wanted to make it look nice and kind of uh, also put it together, and they put a bit of concrete in it to hold it up. Got a lot of criticism, for, criticism over that. But internally, it's as it was 5,200 BC, and it's still watertight today. I mean, they have this corbel vault ceiling, that's, and they put the reason it's watertight is they actually had. Uh, like a little gully system to drain the water away, so it's it's very sophisticated from the inside out. Um, you know what? I have a uh, call here. Let's see who. Sure. Somebody called in. Hi there. Hi there. Hey. How are you doing, see me? We're doing well. Hey. Hey. Hello. Yeah, you're on the air with uh, with. Uh, oh, okay. I'm live. <laughs> you're live. You're live. Hi, this is Jason. I'm calling from. Uh, uh, just outside of Wichita, Kansas. Um, Hi, Jason. I had a question. Something that provoked. Hi, Jason. Uh, uh, howdy. Um, you might want to turn. The, uh, if you have your computer turned up, would you turn that down? You're getting an echo. I, yeah, I already muted it. Um, okay. I had a question for your guest, um, sure. Mr. Swaggy. Um He was talking about how uh, somehow or another the satellites in geosynchronous orbit or whatever orbiting the Earth. We're uh, coming up with uh, erroneous calculations, and somehow the solar system seems to be in a wobble. Um, I don't know if you either of you have heard of uh, Dr. Kishava Bot. I don't know too much about him. I haven't read his book or anything, but I came across a website that put forth the, the hypothesis that the Earth and all the planets in the solar system 
are rotating around the sun in a helical vortex rather than a, um, on the elliptical plane of the, the sun. I was wondering if either of you uh, know anything about it or could speak to that being a possibility. I'll as defer to that the, question to James. Uh, hi, Jason. No, I'm actually not familiar with that author. Uh, I got a little echo there. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I actually take what I said about the satellite from an author called Walter Cutton, and he was also interviewed me. He's a fellow author and friend of mine. Um, you know, he's done a lot into the procession of the solar system that is from an external influence, but I'm not familiar with the, the Haiti, uh, is, what did he say, a, a vortex. Uh, not, I'm not actually familiar with that theory, so I must read into yeah, that. This, I certainly will do. Yeah, this gentleman, his name is uh, Kishava. K e s h a v a, b h a t. Um, sure. I believe he's Asian Indian, if I'm not mistaken. He's a doctor. He passed away some time back. I don't know too much about him. I just came across this website that uh, put forth this uh, hypothesis that the sun is moving in a trajectory, circumnavigating the the center of the galaxy, and that the instead of the the planets like circumnavigating the sun on the elliptical plane of the sun he's saying they're rotating kind of like uh, I don't even know how exactly to describe it or explain it. you'd have to look I, into it but I actually know what you're getting at the, 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 the motion is uh, not an external something tugging on it but it's the, it's the motion from it actually going around the galaxy in a, in a vortex fashion line very interesting yeah in the and the, the, the planets are, like, dragging behind the sun in a, a fashion that's not in accord with what the present but, model suggests. I don't know. I'm well, not an astrologer. I'm not, I don't know anything, but... <laughs> sure. Well, Jason... I just thought that, maybe that, that, that... Yeah, sure, Jason. In that model, then, you wouldn't need an external influence to cause precession. Um, you know, that would make... Well, he suggested the analemma wouldn't even uh, actually present itself if it wasn't for the fact that the all the planets are rotating behind in the wake of the sun, if you will, they're circulating in the wake of the sun is the best way I could describe it without uh, mm. being a wordsmith or <laughs> having pictures to present the suggestion. But the, the he's suggesting that they're rotating in a. a I just. Yeah, you'd have to look into it. And, uh, I'd be interested get in getting a link from you about, if you but, uh, if you can send yeah, us. Yeah, definitely be something to look into. That might. That's great, Jason. Hey. I appreciate the information. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for taking my call, Randy. Hey, thanks for have calling in. Send us a link on that. I'll look at that. Yeah, I'd, I'd okay. be interested in I'd be interested in that. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. Have a good evening. Thanks, Jason. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, sir. Bye bye. Sorry about the echo on that. I'm not sure. I was trying to engineer that out, but that was on that line no for worries. some reason. No, that's very interesting, Randy. I mean, that's again, it's off topic. Why, why we have procession? I'm only dealing with their their knowledge sure. of procession, but uh, yeah, that's that would actually explain. I mean, it's it's still not thought, even if the solar system is wobbling. That would mean why it's all wobbling together. If and 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 what he just said wouldn't need that external influence that a uh, dark star or nemesis out there yeah Jason by the way if you're still listening online and paste a link into one of the chats we'll take a look at that that's that's pretty I've, I yeah. think I've heard a, something about that before being theorized no. but I didn't know a source for it yeah it sure. is off topic but it's it's all no, that's, related that's, that's, that's the best that's the best times you get stuff when you're off topic yeah so. it, it, it takes it in another direction that's that's why we try to do live radio and, and involve people sure so um yeah just on, just on procession itself then uh you know what, what i tried to do in the book randy was to you know develop passage grave cosmology basically Start from the bottom up. Explain what these were guys were doing with just the solstices and the and the equinox. Yeah, explain why they were doing that. I mean, there's evidence that they were building calendars. And why the hell would you need a calendar? Yeah, I had to, yeah. I had to ask myself that question. And when I found the evidence of procession, I was the two go hand in hand. You can't look at procession unless you have a calendar. And calendars, I mean, 
you really need to be using calendars for something. I mean, look at the Mayans. They had uh, God knows how many calendars. I think they had a calendar for the human gestation period. They had a calendar that was 360 days long. They had a solar calendar that was accurate to four decimal places, like, you know, with the 360.25234 law. So, you know, you need calendars for something, yeah? And, right, right. You know, I, so I found evidence in, in Carol Keel of this procession monitoring, basically, I call it. Processional monitoring. And it may have only been a scientific curiosity to these guys, Randy. It may have been the limit of what they were doing. But they were, the, evidence, the thing is, I found evidence that they were doing it. That, that's first and foremost what I'm trying to do is raise people's awareness that these guys were looking at procession. They, were, they had the sun figured out they had the motions of the moon which are by the way are very complex it's not easy to look at i mean there's there's how the moon and the and the sun uh how the moon and the sun work together as well um my question so, would be twofold first off is there any indication that there were records that were maintained is that part of what the the, the rock art is were they maintaining yes. record bases a good database question. good question yeah um that's what I think these things were. I think the Pasha's grave, that's why you have all this rock art displayed on the curbs, because I think they walked around these things, and they were the teaching platforms. They would just, this was like a, a Stone Age university, Randy, where they would have their pupils walk around these things and go, this is the rock art, that squiggly line means this, and they would explain the lunar, and this is what you're going to see, if you know... I mean, there's constellations facing their own image on the sky on the horizon, you know, and then there's like um, evidence of calculations like lines like with dashes on it and, you know, trying to figure things out. And Maybe they didn't have it all figured out, Randy, but there's evidence, I mean, that they have the synodic and the sidereal lunar month, I mean, very, very accurately. I mean, let's just say what they are. Basically, one's two days shorter than the other. Right, we're, right, right. Yeah, that and this is, it's interesting that they would have calculated them at that time with that, that amount of precision. But then again, and they just did it in different ways, Ronnie. This is the thing. They, they used their intuition and their mindset. And I mean, they didn't have modern equipment. They had what they had. Well, I was going to yeah. ask you, do you believe that they had anything other than on-the-ground observation abilities? and uh, You know, crude telescopes. Personally, personally, no, but I do have... Uh, reservations, some sort of a weird hang up about how they got their knowledge because I do think that they had this yeah. trans transfer of knowledge with the Dogon because as I'll get to the Dogon link that you know there is evidence that you know there's there's links with the Dogon, the same symbology meaning the same astronomical things that the Dogon talk okay, about. Okay, let's talk about let's uh, first so uh, define I, I, the Dogon and a little bit about them because I'm not assuming that people ha all know about this, so I'll ask you questions that sometimes are kind of ground level. Sure. Uh, the Dogon were researched by uh, Marcel Griol, a French anthropologist, and, a, and another guy. I forget the other partner's name, but they went and lived with the Dogon, and they wrote research papers on them. And uh, They were largely in French until Robert Temple picked up this subject and uh, brought it to the world in the 70s and 80s. Uh, and... and made some startling claims to what the Dogon actually know about. And it's proved that the Dogon have knowledge of Sirius, but the Dogon, although that's what they're known for in popular culture now, they also have a lot of scientific uh, know-how, if you want to call it that. Um, I mean, these guys collect pigeon dung and live in one of the hottest barren places of Western Africa. I mean... Mm -hmm. Supposedly, uh, from the works of Lars Granton, they marched out of ancient Egypt because ancient Egypt at the time was being corrupted and they didn't want to fall to this corruption. So they marched along the top of North Africa and then down into uh, to West Africa, where they presently reside today. So the evidence is that they, they go back to ancient Egypt. Um, Lars Granton is a computer scientist. Yes, I'm shown. familiar with some of his work, as a matter of fact, and I'm glad you? you brought him up. Yeah, I'm, I'm friends with him on Facebook, and I had asked him about, uh, has he ever come across the Newgrange Dogon link before? And he goes, some people have mentioned it to him before. He said, it's not something he's personally gone into, but he hears about it all the time. And uh, Basically, they have symbology of the spiral, just like Newgrange, and these... Uh, what I call sun wheels. They're basically a, a circle with eight rays on it, or eight segments. Yeah, 
mm-hmm. basically like a wagon wheel on a on a carriage. Um, and you know, it's it's what these symbols actually mean as well. Um, and it's what they actually mean in ancient Egypt. And not just the 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 sun wheel and the spiral are particular to what I call uh, the megalithic builders, but they have other stuff. Uh, symbology that's synonymous with ancient Egypt as well um, so it's a bit of a complex grey area Randy to get into but basically when you treat the Dogon you, you treat them as coming out of ancient Egypt um, and you've got to take uh, the serious wealth of information that Lars Granton has brought to the table um, I mean he's proven on so many counts that their Dogon science as he calls it is an ancient Egyptian science that uh, they have protected over the years through uh, celestial lore and scientific lore. Um, again, the Egypt- ancient Egyptians were subserious, so did the Dogon. And um, the Dogon say they got their knowledge from teachers. Again, mm-hmm. mysteriously handing it over to somebody else. <laughs> um, but what I found in, in my research is that there's two particular images. Um, the Stogon sun wheel and the spiral um, meaning the same things I mean the sun wheels that I'm talking about uh, represent a heliacal rising um, to the ancient Egyptians and therefore to the, uh, the Dogon as well and these sun wheels are what's drawing on a rock art at one of these passage graves representing the Pleiades constellation now the thing about this is the Pleiades looks at this rock art in that epoch when it was built and it does so on a heliacal rising as well. It's like so many points of contact there in, in terms of the science, what it's meaning and interpretation that, you know, I can't explain what that Dogon link is. I can just tell you that it's there, you know, and that's, that's open for readers to go and explore. I didn't want to go down this whole hypothesis or fanciful idea of an explanation well because you also wind up going even further back because then you go back in through Egypt and you have some very interesting ripples in history that I don't think are resolved so well this this is the thing that I think I'll just tell you another thing that uh, I researched the article not long before I was finishing the book and I just came across it by chance it's from a guy called Philip Coppins uh, another author and researcher great guy he does some great stuff but uh, he had an article on his website about Callanish megalithic monument in the northwest of Scotland mm-hmm. now Callanish has long been known to have lunar uh, alignments uh, alignments to the Pleiades in a certain period when it was built um, but the ancient Greeks talked about this special uh, megalithic temple of the north the Hyperborean temple um, yes yes uh, and the thing is Callanish fits is the only place in the north of, of Greece, by the way, uh, to the north, uh, uh, at that latitude that fits the Pleiades alignment, um, it's on an island the same size as it, Sicily, and that's the same size as the Outer Hebrides where it sits at, it's the same size as Sicily in landmass. And it, it's so many points of uh, commonality with this story of the Hyberian Temple, there's nowhere else that fits it. I mean, the thing is, it has to be at that latitude for the Pleiades alignment to take place and indeed it is at that latitude and it has the Pleiades alignment it's on the same size island so he wrote this lovely article but at the end of the article I mean the Greeks talk about a race of black people building this carrying the stones to the islands to build a hyperborean temple so the thing is I'm just picking up on that and going well is that I mean in in the article Philip Hoppins talks about did black hair is it black haired race or black people as yeah, in yeah. Um, a culture of black people so you know but the, the preponderance it, does seem to go to it being a black skinned race of people uh, that's what they said a black yeah. race of people they didn't I think I mean, Philip did that because Philip addresses things sometimes pretty analytically as well yeah, and, 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 and that's he, fair enough. But yeah. I appreciate for that. I mean, that's also somebody else's interpretation too. But he's given all the accounts of right. what it may actually be. But um, very thorough in the research of the Hyperborean Temple. But um, the thing is, I mean, there we have. Uh, I mean, possibility of a knowledge of a black race of people coming by boat. By the way, um, the megalithers bu- builders. Basically, they weren't just confined to Ireland. They were in North Scotland, Wales. 
uh, coast of Holland, coast of Brittany, coast of North Spain, Portugal. Um, and that's why I actually went to Alcalá in the Algarve as well. I wanted to get a feel for the place too. But Alcalá in the Algarve, southern Portugal, is just across from the Straits of Gibraltar, basically North Africa, uh-huh. where, the, where the Dogon marched. So... I'm Wait, interested, you know, because I'm sitting here listening to you describe this, and I'm thinking, is this also a migrational line? What? Well, that's that's what I was trying to get at in the book. Okay. You know, I, I just saying, in southern Portugal, they were building passage graves, very strong links to the Scottish passage graves and their art. Yeah? yeah, they clearly all these passage grave builders, they clearly came from the one place. They clearly came by boat. Um, they were a maritime culture, as far as I'm concerned. Some people don't even address that at all, Randy. But they were in close proximity to North Africa. And if you're in close proximity to North Africa and you have a boat, and there's also evidence of a black race of people, it's, all roads are starting to head to a, a transfer of culture or transfer of knowledge somehow. Um, that's my only one kind of... I'm just trying to put a few things in there that I've discovered, and I think they're worthy of mention. Um, again, I leave it open to the readers to digest that information and do what they will. Um, but I didn't want to leave any of the re- readers unhinged. I didn't want to download all this archaeoastronomy data and then go, okay, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I didn't want to speculate too much either, Randy. You know, I just I said... That's yeah, you kind, of, you kind of set your parameters. So what is the cosmology aspect of this in terms of defining it? I mean, we think of cosmology today as, you know, stellar explosions and galaxies and yeah, yeah. You know, light years. And, you know, we're kind of just bombarded it with Discovery Channel and, and National Geographic. But well, we grew I mean, up watching Star Trek. That didn't help either. That's <laughs> true. True. But, I mean, you know, a cosmology is basically, basically you're, you're compiling knowledge on top of knowledge on, on top of knowledge to, to figure things out to figure out your place in the cosmos basically and that may start with little old planet earth here but uh, I mean what were these guys doing like they were looking at the stars and they were figuring out a cycle of time it may have been just a solar year to start with they built a calendar on that well but um, they were and they were also highly focused I mean why very, intent, very intentively focused why serious why Cassiopeia and why, why the Pleiades? The Pleiades. Yeah. I mean, this again, particularly uh, the Sirius and Pleiades. They just keep coming up in ancient cultures. They just keep coming up again and again. In, ter- in terms of uh, Sirius, uh, it was very important to the Egyptians. Uh, in terms of Pleiades, the Pleiades was what they call an artifact of the skies back then. Um, in other words, in the epoch 3200 BC, I happened to land, uh, it would rise on the horizon due west um, and set due east. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, yeah. And of course, east and west is also very, is where the spring and autumn equinox is. So if you were going to look at any cycles, Pleiades is the thing you're going to be using because, you know, you've got the sun on a uh, spring and autumn equinox doing things. Again, east and west is the band of the equator, and you're always going to see the moon coming up. Um, and then if you've got a constellation coming there, you're going to look at that as well. So it was probably a very good reason for the Pleiades. Um, but again, the Pleiades comes up in a lot of cultures, um, ancient cultures. You know, it's, it's, it's one astronomical reason I have, but then there's also this other cultural reason that it's popping up as well. So again, a grey area, why the Pleiades? Again, Sirius, um, a lot of mystery around Sirius. A lot of mysteries, not. Um, so yeah, I mean, the thing is, constellations. When you when you start getting into constellations, you're talking very deep cycles, very complex cycles. Um, you're talking about a lot of body of knowledge. Um, you first have to know that the band of the equator rising in the east, setting in the west, the sun. Then you're going to see that there's a band of constellations. You've got to name the constellations. You're talking about a very scientific body of knowledge to build. I'm talking a basic cosmology of just constellations, stars, and what's happening in lunar and solar. Even that much alone, what I call the passage grave cosmology. Um, it might be far off for what we know today, but it's it's a very it's a very well put together cosmology that they had, and it's and it's looking like they were researching a uh, procession. It's probably why the passage graves actually fell out of use too, Randy. Um, I mean, I go into the triple spiral on the entrance stone, and and when you look at all the other processional knowledge that they had of the other places, um, 
particularly Loch Crew is more to do with calendar building and, and hammering down these solar days, breaking the, the year into four parts, then breaking the four parts into eight, and then breaking those eight parts into 16. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, the pagan Celtic calendar still um, has bodies of that today. Um, what we call, I mean, that's where the Halloween festival comes from. I did a show for Halloween right. special. Sol and yeah, all these, right. So, uh, and the so, numbers... So, the yeah. Sowen the Sowen festival comes from that actual calendar building yes, of the past yes, great. It does. You know, and a lot of people have broken and detached there's a disconnect there now. But uh you know, so Hello? Yeah, yeah. I'm here. I'm here. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's this weird disconnect now. But you know, I think these guys needed this calendar to go to this procession. But when you get to Newgrange, it looks like they were actually trying to calculate the rate of procession. And by that, I believe they were the series would rise on the horizon and they hit the triple spiral. And the triple spiral basically is actually a double spiral with one spiral attached to it. Um, and the reason I tell you that is the double spiral was their symbol for the equinox. Uh, a spiral going one way and a spiral going the other. Um, and and that triple spiral actually uh, only occurs in two places. Once on the, on t- to the left of the centre of the entrance stone and again inside. Um, and the series rose on the horizon. I, I go into a lot of uh, computer simulations to explain this and, and I give you the little bit of math at the end for those that want to look it up. But uh, it's, it's basically a breakdown of... Basically... All they would have to do was count how many years it took Sirius from the time it hit the triple spiral on the outside till the time it landed inside. And, and, and it may be a, a very crude processional calculator, but you're basically measuring uh, the, the, width of the, the width of the angle. Yeah? Um, the may have, the, why you were doing that, that may have just been th- that alone. I, know, I, 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 don't just, know about I can't wrap my mind around a culture where allegedly people didn't live very long but they're tracking the gradients of a cycle that's essentially 26,000 years. Well, l- let's put it in the simpler terms, Randy. Yeah, because a lot of people just hear 26,000 years and they go, well, they only live 25, and they're thinking of those two numbers. And I used to think that when I got into research in my 20s, and, and that's even with astronomy knowledge, I kind of got a bit bamboozled by that. But I mean, put it like this, we're, we're talking about three generations before the thing's built, so they're not seeing it finished. Um, so you might only you, you'd notice procession over a 200 year cycle you wouldn't need to see it to 26,000 years Randy yeah mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know I mean if you built a stone row and you aligned it to a constellation I mean 70 years later it's one degree off you would notice that I mean basically you're looking at it every year watching it go out and then if 200 years had passed that's probably way, maybe why they built these in clusters of 200 years apart Lock Crew was built 3500 BC. Maybe they moved up to Newgrange and, and in 3200 BC started the new 200 year research model. Basic, maybe it was, you know, yeah, it's, it's no matter what way you look at it, it's still hard. But, you know, a lot of people can just think procession, they couldn't have been doing that. But, I mean, they could have been doing it crudely, Randy. That's what I'm trying to get at in the book. You know, it could have been a crude process where they just wanted to know what it was first and foremost. Yeah? Yeah. That's, Let's find out what this thing is. Okay, it's a deeper cycle and it's very, very slow. Why is it doing it? Well, I don't know, but let's measure it first. Let's start with that. That's what you do in cosmology. You go, let's run with what we can, see where it leads us. There's a bit of guesswork and there's a bit of luck involved too, Randy. That's what cosmology is. There's a lot of luck involved. So it's very interesting though, Randy. And you know, when you, when you get into exactly what they're doing, you get led down this path and you go, and you stop and you go, hang on a minute. Is that what they were up to? That's not what we're taught in school. <laughs> like, and you these know, were not these were not ignorant savages. These were not no. people that were unaware. Of 30, 40, 30, 40 years ago, Randy, they were painted as dummies. They really were. They were painted as Stone Age dummies, uh, and they were building all these things because they needed to know when to till the land. They needed to know when to start their farming year. You know, come on now. <laughs> they, if they still bandy that about these days, like you know. I have no respect for them. Like, yeah, you know, I don't buy that either. There's a Be- body of knowledge out there now, Randy, that's really starting to mount. It's this. It's a lot of, 
um, just in, in other ancient cultures all around the world, there's a lot of circumstantial knowledge of this murky past where, you know, it's not this civilization there and it's not this civilization over there. Um, you know, th- there's some cross-cultural bodies of knowledge getting mixed up, particularly what I talk about, the Dogon and, um, and the megalithic builders. But yeah, I mean, there's evidence that there's cocaine and tobacco in the, in the DNA hair samples of the mummies in Egypt. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. You know, and there was a big National Geographic special on that, and eventually they proved it to be true, and they were backed into a corner, and the Egyptologists turn around, and all they will admit to is, quote, rudimentary contacts. And that's it. <laughs> and they never appo- what they, they slated the woman that found that. I mean, the German uh, a pharmacologist. You know, and I mean... They never apologized to her. <laughs> Do you know what wow. I mean? Wow. So, you know, I didn't realize they... they yeah. Yeah, they, 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 they even brought out a national... Two specials on it. The first one proved that it was maybe contamination, and it was a bit of a murky, well, we don't really know, and, and it was a lot of kind of... It was a bit of a disinformation, if you want to call it that. The second time around, they kind of went, yeah, well, maybe there was rudimentary contacts. But, I mean, that's just one example of what I mean... You've got evidence that the Easter Island uh, script is matching up with Mohenjo-Daro. It's what I go into in my new book. Um, you know, this cross-cultural problem that, you know, the Phoenicians were popping up in Brazil. There's evidence of Phoenician writing over there. So, you know, I think there's a maritime culture in 3000 BC. That's one thing I kind of, I'm very much strongly uh, adhere to, Randy, that, you know, 3000 BC was different to what we really think it is like. Um, in terms of their level of knowledge and that's not just astronomy I mean an advanced culture going around by boat really isn't what we were told and it's still what people are finding hard to accept because um, you know there's evidence of ancient maps out there and I talk about that in the end of the book that uh, you know there's a sunken landmass off the coast of Ireland called High Brazil what we call the other Atlantis um, mm-hmm. but again it's 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 Porcupine Bank uh, it's a it's a Sandbank that's just below the water um, that was exposed probably at least definitely 10,000 BC and and could have been the last tip of it disappeared in 4,000 BC. So um, these guys could have you know just been coming off you know rising sea levels and and there's evidence of a series of cataclysms between 10,000 and 4,000 BC backed up by ice core samples in Antarctica. So you know. There's a whole murky past out there now, and, and we are now pushing further backwards. The alternative community of, of, of research is the ones that are actually, you know, bringing the discoveries forward. Um, a lot of the archaeological community is quite silent on a few matters at present. Um, but I think 4000 BC, my, my, my mindset is these megalithic builders, they came and they hit land, Randy. They, they were from the one place... Whatever, if you if you don't even have to put them on a sunken landmass, they came from one single place as an entity, um, and I call it the refugee by boats theory, um, because it's like they didn't have equal numbers. They didn't have one ast- uh, uh, they didn't have one um, astronomer, or one mathematician, one engineer, and one artisan in each boat. They literally had a mixed match of everything, and it was a scramble to get on the boats and get out of whatever they were they were leaving. And that's what that's what it looks like. It's the only thing that explains it. Sunken landmass basically fits that nicely. But um, you know, because you get these passage graves, some have lots of rock art, and then some have absolutely none. They've all got the same basic concept and design, and they're scattered over such vast terrain. I mean, you're talking south South Sweden. Denmark, uh, Holland, Brittany, Wales, the Channel Islands, Scotland, Ireland, um, Northwest Spain, and and Southern Portugal, and they're all coastal regions. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you've also got the problem that uh, you know nobody's putting this together. They're all talking about these things as a separate entity. You know. That's exactly right, and that's what I found intriguing reading through your book. And, and discussing this with you and some of the connections that you're making because up until now, every dig's been separate and there hasn't been an attempt to really integrate the findings in a way that we begin to get this larger picture that you're painting on the show tonight. I mean, really what we're doing is we're doing a broad overview, but you've, you've painted a broad picture that I think a lot of people in a lot of different disciplines can grab onto. Sure, you know, I, I got, I, I got obviously my, 
astronomy and the engineering skill set, and that's what I wanted to bring to in the book. Um, and again, the Dogon links, a nice little twist on the tale that I discovered. I just wanted to make that little twist in there and, and deliver it the way I found it and, and not do much with it. I want, that's up to other people to go and, and research, yeah. Um, I could have easily brought some of Robert Temple's book in there and just regurgitated some of that, but I didn't want to do that. I didn't feel the need to do that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I also have my historical mysteries and, and stuff that I appeal to, you know. So I have another body of knowledge to kind of throw some speculation in at the end of the book as well so uh, but yeah I mean basically we're living in a period now Randy where we're rewriting history books um, and certainly we're going to look back at this period in 20 years and go things really changed and I, I said to you just by text there that Gebekli Tepe's helping do that um, yeah. you know it's, it's a megalithic the, this, is, this is the elephant in the middle of the room right now this is, the daddy that's gonna, yeah. this is the daddy that's going to rewrite the history books and that's when I say the archaeological community is uh, very silent and I'm going there in the new year I can't wait because I've, I've been once before it was for a brief uh, I was in Turkey on holiday and it was just a brief uh, quick look but uh, I'm going back to take a lot of photos this time and take some measurements with the compass and uh, I want to look for there's evidence now of uh, some astronomy alignments and uh, I mean these these spiral concentric circles are made of 15 to 20 ton stones that are T-shaped um, and they've only uncovered 5% of this complex there's 20 of these basically 10,000 B stone hedges all sitting buried and the thing is 8000 BC this was all backfilled and deliberately buried to protect it poss quite possibly to protect it that's the biggest brain bender of all like who backfilled in a mountain just to, just to cover this complex but um, I mean we weren't supposed to look past 3000 BC and this is the thing about I talk, keep talking about this 3000 BC question I think we're going to talk about this in years to come that you know 3000 BC all around the world the megalithic civilizations, one culture. Um, you got Mohenjo-daro, you got the Chinese, you got ancient Egypt, you got the uh, the Olmecs in and and Peru as well. Um, you got these civilizations all popping up at the same time. Um, you know, and why 3000 BC? Why the, why is these cultures all just independently jumping up? Yeah, you yeah, got pyramid, yeah. you got you got pyramid building all building all around the world as well. The Chinese had pyramids. Um, Peru has pyramids. Uh, Central America has pyramids. You get them in uh, the Azores uh, uh, in um, off the co west coast of Africa as well, and then you got them in ancient Egypt as well. And we're not supposed to make any links. Oh, a lot of these places had mummification as well. Um, it, there's, there's the Tara mummies in China. Peru had mummies. Egypt had mummies. Central America had mummies. Oh, we're not supposed to make any connection again. Okay, so you know. The 3000 BC question is a big thing. I mean, well, you know, it's like when I was young and looking at the similarities between the Mayan pyramids and the Egyptian pyramids, and there's moderate differences. Obviously, the South American pyramids are step pyramids as opposed yeah. to the plain structures you have in Egypt. But it's like there were too many overlaps, too many similarities, and nobody seemed to be willing to even speculate Come on this. Yeah. Nobody willing to come forward, and I mean that's again the controls we have from academia, you know the shackles, the shackles of academia that you know you're told the mindset, you know you're, that's how you have to think, and anything outside that you're going to be shunned for it, you know, and that's not a good way, to, you know, that's not a good way to e evolve as a species, like it really is, not intellectually anyway. I'm talking, but um, well, I can't yeah. help but think that there is an aspect to all of this that you know. It, <laughs> It always seems to go back to what they won't talk about, they being the prevailing authorities and powers. And that links into these cultures' interconnectedness and something even bigger. Because sure. what Robert Temple uncovered in his, his work with Sirius seems to indicate we have a connection to something out there. And I know that sure. takes us into woo-woo land, but we'll go there for a second or two because we're bumping okay. up on the end of the show. And, you know. Sure. You know, Robert Temple actually wrote another book, I think it was called The Crystal Sun. Yes. Um, yes. I don't know if you're familiar with that. And he, he, I, I've done a lot of uh, work on ancient crystals and um, 
the engineering aspects of it, I should say. Um, you know, but there's ancient crystals out there that have been toroidally ground, and basically that means a donut-shaped tool was used to grind lenses. Mm-hmm. Now, they're made out of crystal, and crystal is very hard. I mean, crystal is only cut, rock crystal, you can only cut it with rock crystal or diamonds. It's a hardness scale of nine. So, to grind something with a tool, that's the tool's more complicated than what you actually made. <laughs> so... <laughs> But these things, there's, there's, so, there's thousands of ancient lenses out there. Um, and the reason he went into that book was he said, well, where did the Dogon get this? Did they have a telescope, basically? So I think that's where he was coming from with that. But uh, he ended up going off on another tangent where, you know, I think they would have had to have a big, pretty big telescope to be looking at it. But, you know, there was still that reasoning behind his mindset. And I understand that. Um, you know, and he's, un- he's uncovered some high technology in, in, in the ancient crystals there. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, there's a high technology back in, in ancient times, Randy. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, I think we. You know, highly that. sophisticated body of, I call it intuitive knowledge all the time. It's like they just had, they didn't have a material-based way of going about it. Don't forget, all our intellect, we need our materials to do it. We need electricity. We we can't run our equipment to find the stuff out. You know, telescopes are cooled down. They're monitored by robotic telescopes. You know, we need electricity to do that. Right. Yeah? Right. Yeah, you know, yeah. so we're a material-based civilization. Now we may be able to to shine telescopes across the galaxy and just figure out some crazy stuff like, you know, but we're still a material-based civilization. These guys just did it a different way. You know, they were just had an intuitive way of doing things. You see, things. that may actually be one of the insights that are a takeaway tonight. Yeah, is that we're looking at a culture through the lens of a materially-based society and not yeah. understanding that there was another. We're handicapped. Yeah. yeah. We're handicapped the way we have to look at these guys, you know. Um, and that's, you know, I, I, it was a bit of a disco- self-discovery thing for me, too, to be, as I say, I, I thought I, I knew the Megalith civilization, but I didn't, you know. And I just realized their mindset, you know. And I have to say, I, of all the passionate graves, I went back, I was having a romantic weekend last weekend, and I actually went to a passionate grave just for a ramble around, because, you know, the amount of times I've been there, I kind of got uh, kind of desensitized to actually the, the function of the place by just constantly looking for an answer, constantly looking at the measurements and, you know, looking at the angles. And, of course, some of these shine, some of these point to each other on the other peaks and all. You know, I switched the analytical mind off and I just sat there and kind of looked at the landscape and kind of with uh, my fiance and just had a look there and went, you know, look. I kind of appreciated it for what it was, Randy, you know, and that's mm-hmm. kind of, I needed to do that because that's what I took out of the book, you know, and I was starting to lose a bit of that, so, you know, we, and it, it's just what you said tonight, to taking away an insight and a mindset of what these guys were up to like. Definitely like. I think that uh, a lot of the things that you cover in the book were uh, groundwork for, uh, like I said, work that other p- people can do and work that you probably pick up along the way as well because sh- the sh- questions the questions that I have are ex- almost become existential at this point sure I should actually just mention the acoustics thing because uh, yeah let's t- let's go there I was I, I was aware I actually was aware um there's a book called Stone Age Soundtracks by uh, Paul Devereaux which I had read it's uh, released in 2001 and that uh, He'd gone into uh, passage grave acoustics. It's, you know, there's this other the thing is, if the astronomy wasn't enough for you, I mean, there's this other thing that there's this paranormal acoustic experience inside these chambers. Um, there's evidence that Stonehenge amplifies acoustics, and that's why some of these stones were built at, at the angles and the shapes that they were. Um, but equally, uh, these passage graves have side chambers and when you chant and hum and, and the, your, your chest cavity almost res- resonates inside but uh, because I was going around so many of these I didn't want to go back around and have to go spend another year doing some acoustic measurements so I took the acoustic measurements alongside doing it with the, with the, uh, the hope to possibly write an acoustics book sometime but the reason being I was also aware of the entoptic phenomena rock art and I was also a fear of the acoustics but I don't know of anybody putting that together so that's my New Year's project but uh, <laughs> you know to, just to tell you the cultural aspect of it I mean it looks like some people say these guys were taking magic mushrooms and they were going on transcendental. I was going to bring that up, but I actually decided against it. Well, there's, <laughs> there's, 
this this is what I don't get because there's two. Graham Hancock in his book Supernatural goes uh, into entoptic phenomena, and you know he's taken hallucinogens himself um, to research the subject. But he's also gone to the San Art, San, San Rock Art in South Africa, and these guys do it by acoustics and chanting and yeah. tribal tribal dance. Now yeah. they have to do it for 24 hours. They fast and they do it through fatigue and sheer body shock um, and acoustics. So, you know, there's, there's two ways you can go into these altered states of consciousness, either hallucinogens or, you know, acoustics. Maybe they did both. Like, I don't know, but uh, I've done some acoustic measurements inside, and the preliminary findings certainly are indicative of the, the, the resonance is enhanced um, by the internal layout. And uh, quite possibly, these guys were maybe going into altered states of consciousness inside these monuments in the dark, Um you know, waiting on that beam of sunlight to come in to, like, have a transformative experience. I mean, it, it'd be pretty out here to think that, you know. That's, there's there's evidence, sorry, Ren. No, it's a pretty intense yeah. experience if you stop to think about it. I mean, are, the, yeah. I mean, you can't get near Newgrange. Newgrange is, uh, you, you're taken there by shuttle bus across the river and all. Yeah, it's it's totally closed off. It's it's the most protected monument in the north of Ireland. Uh, like, there's something like 250,000 people a year go there. But the ones in Carrow Keel and Loch Crew, you know what I mean? Loch Crew, um, even Fornox, you can actually go to a, somebody's house and get the key. This is what Ireland is like, by the way. <laughs> you can actually go knock somebody's door, give them 50 quid, and just take the key and go off and do your little thing and come back again. Like. So, uh, But the ones up in Carrow Keel have no doors on them. They're literally up on this barren landscape looking out to the Atlantic, basically. Yeah. Next up, New York, basically, 5,000 kilometers of water. You want to see the, the, the place, it's like, so picturesque and beautiful, but it's so out of the way. I mean, they're protected just by where they're sitting. Like, you know, nobody's going to hike up there and, and damage them. Besides, like, there's very little left to damage. They're not as, uh, they're not as um, highly kind of engineered. as They're a bit more primitive looking. But uh, a lot of people go up there and, uh, and have, have uh, paranormal experiences, like, still today, like. Yeah, they go up there and, and try it out, like. I won't elaborate on that, but uh, now I, I had gone up there to take some measurements because they were more accessible, Randy, and uh, that's where I got some of my findings because there's 15 of them there, um, and I did some of the stuff at Lock Crew as well when I got the key there. Um, so, yeah, it looks like the chambers do resonate and peak. Um, they, they certainly uh, amplify to, to resonance. Um, so, again, you know, this is the thing that the, the resonance that this happens at is between 10 and 15 hertz, and that's the effect. It's actually some, it depends on the passage drives and the layout, but some between 5 and 15 hertz, and that's the uh, hertz range that affects the uh, consciousness of the brain. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the range that you work in for altered states of consciousness, if you want. So, yeah, I mean, you know, as if the astronomy wasn't enough, were they doing that as well? Like, but. You know, you could say maybe they were, maybe they weren't, but when you look at the evidence of Stonehenge, let's, let's not separate Stonehenge now because it's a, a stone circle. It's no, no, same no, pe- I wanted to pull that into the conversation. That's actually yeah, a good connection. Yeah, because if people go, well, they're stone circles and they're passage graves, but it's the same culture to build all these. You know, the, the guys were lifting very large stones and doing complex structures with them, yeah? It doesn't matter whether it's a stone cross like Kalanish or stone circles or stone rows or just standing stones or, or passage graves. It's the same group of people, you know. Basically, the passage graves were really buried, some of these people. Um, you know, in England, they, have a, they don't really have passage graves. They have like a long burrow. They're like a, an oblong passage grave, um, but again, this, the Stonehenge monuments show strong acoustic evidence, which then is synonymous with the passage graves. So, you know, we're there is sonar culture as well as an astronomy-based culture. Um, and I say sonar as in they worked with sonar knowledge. You know, where they, they were more familiar with acoustics than we think they were. You know, so again, that just heightens the advanced um, mindset that they have. Like, you know, it really... You know, it boggles the mind, Randy, the more, you, the more we know. And, you know, as I say, in the last 20 years, we're able to use scientific methods to peer into the past. Um, again, archaeoastronomy and archaeoacoustics is the name for the acoustics of the past, basically. Uh, you know, so, you know, you've got people using scientific equipment to figure things out, to put things together and, and, and show people, you know, you know what, what, what these guys were up to. 
I should say, if anybody wants to uh, do any archaeoastronomy themselves, it's a lot easier than you think. You can go to one program that I use called Stellarium.org. That's great, great it. software. I use that, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. So... So you're familiar with it, and it's and, and again you can look at your present day. Uh, you use the F keys, and you can just type in any distant time in the past. Uh, and in the end of the book, I actually provided all the archaeoastronomy data that you need: the GPS coordinates of these places, the height above sea level, um, and the time and the dates to look at all this stuff. Like, and you can see the stuff for yourself. You know, you can generate the own computer simulations. It's very easy to do, and it's a very. The reason I say Stellarium, it's open source. Open where source I love it. Free software, yes. Yeah. Yeah, and it's very easy to use. It's very user friendly, uh, and it's built by astronomers and programmers, like yeah. Yeah, it's course. actually a great program to just pull up and play with. It's got a lot of toys. Exactly. In it. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, you can you can if if you didn't know a constellation, you can type it in. You can type it in and look uh, and find it there your, yourself. Like you know, it's great. It's great for learning and playing with. But if anybody wants to go and check out some stuff in the book, as I say, the archaeoastronomy data, I, I wanted to provide that at the back as well. Like, but uh, but again, this is the scientific tools we have now. We have we don't have to do the number crunching anymore, Randy. That's the beauty of it. Yeah, it really is. Everybody's a discoverer, James. Yep. Um, we're kind of kind of ra- wrapping it up here. Sure. Um, let people know about the book, your upcoming projects, and your websites where you can be found. Sure. My author's page is uh, jamesswagger.com. That's two G's for swagger. jamesswagger.com. Um, and I have a link to my new book, Hidden History, Secret and Science, which should be out by, fingers crossed, uh, December as a digital publication. Um, I'm just wrapping that up now. Um, and my uh, other book is newgrangecosmology.com. Um, it's linked up at jameswagger.com as well. Um, as I say, um, yeah, the Newgrange book, um, I've tried to keep as much as the astronomy out, but I obviously have to go into some detail. But uh, I, I've tried to lay, lay it out for the reader that anybody could pick it up, yeah? yeah that, was my yeah. Main, that was my main aim, Randy. So. Well, you succeeded because I'm... Uh, astronomically impaired, and uh, <laughs> I didn't find it dawning at all to go through what you present. Well, that's that's a good compliment, and I'll take that one on. Randy. <laughs> James, no, it's good. it's been wonderful having you on. It will not be the last. As I said, I I want to get you back. You put out a lot of great ideas in this show, and there's a whole lot of things for um, the listeners to thread through. We'll put links up with the show. And there are sure. links in the bio over at offplanetradio.net right now, and that information will be posted when we put the show up. We're going to kind of wind it up here tonight, and uh, w- let's see, we're going to be back next week. We have, um, coming up next week's kind of another shift. We're going into a different area, but uh, we're going to begin to kind of unravel some legal stuff in terms of uh, law and uh, citizenship. And to do that, Paul Andrew Mitchell will be here. He is supremelaw.org, and we're going to be talking on the first level here about the citizen. Dean Clifford in two weeks, talking the sovereign citizen. And Ann Gal Rose O'Grady is going to be here for the last show of the year on December 19th, a time of change. Akashic Guidance for Spiritual Transformation. That's going to wrap it up for this week. I'm Randy Moggins. This is Off Planet Radio. Uh, Truth is out there, and it's inside you. Keep looking for it.